Hello and welcome to this talk. My name is Lester Hightower and today I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about some insulin related tips and tricks that we use in my family while following the Dr. Richard K. Bernstein's diabetes solution regimen. So I'm going to start by telling you about my connection to type 1 diabetes which is my son uh, Andrew. Andrew was five years old when he was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes in June of 2010 and he is now 16 years old. This graphic shows Andrew's journey with type 1 diabetes, uh, sort of illustrated by A1C. You can see that uh, starting at diagnosis day, his A1C was 10.6, and then we quickly got that down in a couple of months to 5.4, and in the last 11 years, Andrew's maintained A1C is pretty consistently in the 5% range. And the pictures above show the stages of life that we've walked Andrew through uh, the last 11 years uh, with type 1 diabetes, starting at the age of 5 in the top left and the age of 16 uh, in the bottom right. So uh, sort of to quickly compare and contrast uh, Andrew's A1C values to uh, standard outcomes, or prevailing outcomes, if you start five months after Andrew's type 1 diabetes diagnosis and average the 37 A1C tests he's had uh, in those 11 years, they averaged a 4.95% uh, with a standard deviation of 0.2. So uh, most of his A1C results have been between 4.75 and 5.15%. If you compare that 4.95% or essentially 5%, to these findings shown on the right that were published in January of 2019, you can see Andrew's results are you know, well below the bottom of this graph. These graphs show two time periods, uh, A1C results of the same cohort, the same group of people, if you will, from 2010 to 2012, that's shown in orange, and then 2016 to 2018, that's shown in blue. If you can sort of visualize uh, the time periods that we've walked Andrew through uh, with type 1 diabetes, that's age 5 to now age 16. You can see his peer group started off with an A1C average of around 8%. And at this time, around age 16, uh, he is getting pretty close to the top of that mountain that you see there. So in excess of 9% uh, would be the average A1C of, uh, of Andrew's peer group. So listen, managing type 1 diabetes is hard work, and I won't deny that, and I don't think anybody can, but great success is possible, and I believe that it's worth it. And the primary reason is that well-controlled diabetes is the leading cause of nothing, which is one of the slogans of the Revere Foundation, which does business as letmebe83.org. Um, in this presentation, I'll share tips and tricks that have been useful to my family, but this presentation is not intended to be medical advice, and please don't take it as such. So I'll start by talking about uh, AmbiMed insul caps. We began using these in January of 2017. We've used them ever since. Um, each pack comes with a blue cap and an orange cap, which correlate nicely to the bottle colors of Novalin R and Novalog. Uh, I used a lime green Sharpie oil paint pen uh, to paint an orange cap green. And you can see that photographed in the center of the bottom of this slide. So you can see the, uh, the caps on top of our insulin vials colored green, blue, and orange for Levomir, Novalin R, or regular, and Novolog, respectively. You can see the images on either side demonstrate how the caps allow a standard uh, insulin syringe to be slid in and secured very tightly to the vials, which is extremely helpful in terms of stability. We've not ever dropped a vial of insulin uh, while drawing insulin uh, since we started using Ambi caps, uh, excuse me, insul caps from AmbiMed. Um, the other thing that's true is the colorization on the tops also really helps prevent accidentally mixing up insulins. Uh, here's another idea from a person who posted in Type 1 Grip, Type 1 Grit, and that is to use loom bands to help prevent insulin mishaps. So you see in the example here, uh, you know, standard loom bands, uh, excuse me, standard loom bands 
that kids used to make loom band bracelets wrapped around uh, insulin bottles and or pen fill, uh, um, insulin pen fills, uh, and then also wrapped around the syringes uh, that are going to be filled with that particular type of insulin. Another great way to try to prevent insulin uh, bottle mix-ups. Uh, before we used insulin caps, we used this safety sheet uh, for a couple of years uh, to really help try to prevent insulin mix-ups. So we uh, printed these, laminated them, kept them on the kitchen counter uh, with our di diabetes logbook. And when we were to pull insulins, we would lay this sheet down and then set the Novolog, the regular, the Levomir across the top and then uh, write the dosing down and then lay the syringes out and then pick one syringe up, its corresponding bottle, pull that dose, put the bottle back in the thermos that we keep insulin vials in, uh, in the refrigerator, do that one at a time, and you just drastically reduce the possibility of mixing up the vials, which we did a couple of times, and that's quite dangerous actually. When you actually, when you accidentally give Novolog, for example, when you intended to give Levomir, it's a fairly dangerous situation. And we had it happen a couple of times several years ago. And we put in place uh, this method of the safety sheet. And then later when we introduced uh, the insul caps, we've not had another mix up like that in several years. Um, this is how we handle on the go insulin refrigeration. Uh, constant insulin refrigeration is a good idea. Uh, I believe that's particularly true in warm climates. My family lives in Florida. Uh, these photographs demonstrate the way that we carry vials of insulin and keep them cool. Uh, the materials that we use is a 17 ounce stainless steel insulated jar. There's a link there to uh, the Amazon product that we use. We use 10 uh, reusable ice cubes. Uh, they're essentially water inside of plastic and they can be used over and over and over. And then kitchen sponges cut to fit that then protect the insulin from freezing. And so those things are stacked into that um, uh, 17 ounce uh, insulated um, a food jar in the order shown, shown there. So two layers of re reusable ice cubes followed by a cut to fit kitchen sponge and then the three insulin vials on top and then the top goes on to the container and that can stay cool for many, many, many hours even in 9,500 degree Florida weather at the beaches you know, we can get 8, 10, 12 hours uh, out of this arrangement, and it's relatively small and compact, and it works very, very well. Uh, we use pre-filled insulin syringes a lot. Um, my friend R.D. Dykeman has frequently said that the number one goal is normal blood sugars, but the number two goal is to minimize fuss as much as possible, and that's really what pre-filled syringes are for us. They aid in that number two goal. And we've used pre-filled syringes for many, many years and we've never once had a problem. Uh, we use the um, 60 dram prescription bottles that you see pictured here and there's an Amazon link. Um, those fit uh, syringes very nicely. A 30 unit syringe can fit in those 60 dram bottles with about 25 units, up to 25 units of insulin uh, pulled into it. For labeling those, we have a couple of methods. Uh, we sometimes use an Avery brand removable color-coded label. It's their part number 6721. There's an Amazon link there. We also frequently just use a fine-tipped Sharpie permanent marker, and you can see in the center photograph there is an example of how my son carries lunchtime insulin to school. He'll just open the bottle, look in, and have several choices that he can choose from for his lunchtime insulin that sort of starts at a base dose that we would expect for him to have for lunch and goes up in quarter unit insulins in case he's a little higher uh, than he wanted to be than his target was uh, going into lunch. Uh, we also give my son uh, Levomir through the night. Uh, he takes three doses of Levomir a day. Uh, 7 a.m. is his daytime dose and then 9.45 p.m. and 2 a.m. are his other two doses. Um, and for many years, we sat 60 dram bottles beside his bed on a nightstand, labeled as you see there, 9.45 p.m. and 2 a.m., and that worked quite well. Um, in uh, 2018, uh, we started having some problems where my wife and I would sleep through our alarms, frankly due to sleep deprivation. Um, and so I invented this thing called Basil Sure. 
and we have used this since December of 2018. So we no longer use the, the 60 gram bottle shown on the left. Instead, we use a basal shear device that sits on my son's nightstand. And you can see in the photographs there in the center and to the right, um, the basal shear device accepts uh, two syringes, um, one for 9.45, one for 2 a.m. There's a little embedded computer in there and it expects those syringes to be pulled out at the appropriate time. And if those syringes are not pulled out when the basal shear device expects them to be, it triggers an alarm and, uh, and you know, alerts us to, 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 to administer the insulin as needed. Uh, since we've been using basal shear, uh, which we started using in December of 2018, uh, we have not missed uh, a single uh, overnight dose. So diluting insulin, um, this is one, one that uh, my family actually has not done personally. We never had a need to dilute insulin, but an awful lot of Dr. Bernstein uh, followers do need to, and particularly young children so on a very low carb, uh, high protein diet, insulin doses are much smaller than they are for a lot of uh, type one diabetic patients that eat a higher carb diet. Uh, a great solution to this problem of needing to have you know less insulin but be, still be able to dose well is to dilute the insulin. So each insulin manufacturer offers diluent that can be used with their insulin products. And the picture to the right here is of diluent for the Nova Nordisk insulins. Uh, patients or parents can choose the diluted concentration that works best for them. Some common choices are, are U10, U20, or U50, which are 10%, 20% and 50% potency, mm -hmm. respectively. U100, which is 100% potency, being the common uh, concentration of human insulin. So for example, a U20 dilution is two parts insulin and eight parts diluent. So it's 20% insulin. So if you had a U20 diluted insulin and you wanted to administer 0.6 units of insulin to uh, the patient and you were using U20, you would dose three units in a U100 syringe. And the math is pretty straightforward. You want to achieve 0.6 units, so you divide that by 0.2, which is 20%, or 0.2 units per U100 unit, and 0.6 divided by 0.2 equals three units. So you pull three units in a U100 syringe, and you administer 0.6 units of actual insulin. Um, Mrs. Michelle Thayer has a wonderful resource for diluting insulin on her type 1 diabetes blog. You can find that at the location in the link on this video. Excuse me, the link on the slide. And I will try to also provide this link down below in the description of the video. The last thing I'm gonna talk about is intramuscular insulin injections. So intramuscular insulin injections bring blood sugar down much more rapidly than subcutaneous injections do. Dr. Bernstein teaches that the action of intramuscular begins more rapidly and it finishes at least an hour sooner than subcutaneous. So in my son and in our experience, intramuscular injections of Novolog start about twice as fast and they last about half as long. So for example, subcutaneous Novolog in my son will start working at about 25 to 30 minutes after the injection and it lasts about four to five hours. An intramuscular Novolog injection will start working in about 15 to 20 minutes and will only last about two to two and a half hours. So it really pulls forward the speed at which it lowers blood sugar. In my son, we see no difference in the blood sugar lowering impact of a given dose of Novolog given intramuscularly versus subcutaneously. We only see a change in the speed of action. It's faster to start and it's faster to finish. So that has many advantages. For us during the teenage years and during illness, intramuscular injections have proved very helpful. They reduce the risk from stacking insulin when you're trying to bring down sticky highs. So for example, you know, I always treat unexpected blood sugars at 2 a.m. intramuscularly. And then I recheck my son at 4.30. If his blood sugar is still elevated at 4.30, then I will usually administer another intramuscular dose because unlike subcutaneous dosing, that two and a half hours is really enough to avoid the dangers of insulin stacking, both at 4.30 a.m. when I dosed intramuscularly at 2 a.m. and again at 4.30 a.m. if I dose intramuscularly, but then by the time the 7 a.m. breakfast rolls around, that Novolog is out of his system 
and I don't have much risk of stacking that insulin. So we most often administer in my son's deltoid muscle, but we sometimes use the outer thigh a few inches above the knee, and you can see in the two diagrams uh, to the left and to the center there, uh, roughly where we would inject uh, intermuscular injections. We use 30 unit syringes uh, that are 12.7 millimeter needle length and they have half unit markings and there's a photograph there to the right of a bag of the Walgreens syringes, Walgreens brand syringes that we use. It's important to note that because the longest needle length available in U100 syringes is 12.7 millimeters, you've got to be careful to try to really hit the muscle and you may sometimes miss muscle. So you do have to still be cautious if you're going to stack insulin doses back to back. So an intermuscular is sort of an advanced technique. It's very helpful, um, but you do have to be careful. You have to be cautious uh, not to stack insulin. Uh, intermuscular insulin dosing is taught in chapter 19 of Dr. Bernstein's Diabetes Solution, and I strongly suggest that anybody interested in using intermuscular injections as a tool uh, obtain Dr. Bernstein's book and study uh, his uh, uh, his instructions in chapter 19 about using intermuscular injections. So that's the end of my talk. I hope that you found it helpful and thank you very much for listening.